right? So whenever we're trying to understand scripture, you know, I know some people say that scripture, the Bible is easy. That's not really totally true. The fundamental gospel message is very simple, but uh, the Bible itself is not always so easy to understand. So when we're trying to understand, understand scripture, it's really critical that we look at the text and the context of God's ultimate purpose. Because God's purpose is what drives everything that God does. And that's just kind of a no-duh, no common-sense kind of idea. And uh, one place in the Bible where we find uh, a good summary of God's purpose is actually in the Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer. Especially when Jesus says, Your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. That's pretty much a summary of, of what God's purpose is. Is. And so how will God's uh, kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven? Well, Jesus tells us in the Lord's Prayer, and Jesus tells us in this passage as well, when he says, your will be done. When God's will is done in our lives, that's when his kingdom will come on earth as it is in heaven. And given all of that, it's no exaggeration to say that the most important thing for our lives is to understand and to do the will of God. And when we do that, the kingdom of God, as I said, will come on earth as it is in heaven. The kingdom of God will come into our lives on earth as it is in heaven. And so our passage here today, it shows us three things that Jesus did to do the will of God. And the first thing is this. Jesus suffered. Jesus suffered to do the will of God. So in this text, we find Jesus and his disciples. It's really late at night or early in the morning, however you want to look at it, before Jesus is tried and crucified. And there's some people who say that uh, this is the prelude to what is called uh, Jesus' passion narrative. But it seems to me that the passion narrative starts right here in the Garden of Gethsemane. That word passion, it comes from the Latin word pati, which means suffer, which means to suffer. And when we talk about the passion narrative, when we talk about the passion of Jesus Christ, that's what we're talking about. We are talking about Jesus' suffering. And then verse seven, uh, 37, it tells us, uh, Jesus says, uh, that Jesus began to be sorrowful and troubled. Another translation, it says that Jesus began to be crushed with anguish, crushed with anguish, and that's probably closer to some, what Jesus was actually feeling. Because in the very next verse, he tells his disciples, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Have you ever felt overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. You know, there are some moments in my life when I, have, I may have come close. I can't exactly say that I have been overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, but I do feel like there have been moments in my life when I've come close to that. And I, and I pray that no one, none of you ever has to experience that or even come close to that. But if you have experienced that in your life, or maybe you might be going through something like that even right now, these dark times when you feel sorrowful to the point of death. That doesn't mean that there's anything wrong with you, right? Is there anything wrong with Jesus for being sorrowful to the point of death? No, not at all. And when we experience those things, that doesn't mean that there's something wrong with us either. And if you are feeling in that place, feeling like you're in that place, crushed with anguish, I pray, I pray that there's someone in your life. I pray that there's somebody here that you can share that burden with. That's my constant prayer. But if you feel like there's no one, in, no one here that you can really talk to, I invite you and I encourage you to come talk to me. Come talk to me, and I promise you that I will listen with the ears of Jesus Christ. I will listen with the heart of Jesus Christ. We are a Christian family, and this is what we are called to do, brothers and sisters. 
This is what we are called to do in terms of loving each other. Jesus' suffering is clearly on display here. But we might ask, what is the cause of his suffering exactly? Was it the prospect of dying on the cross? Well, we know what the cross is, right? It was an extremely painful way to die. Crucifixion, it was designed for long-term torture, slow, painful torture that ended up in slow, painful suffocation. That's how people died, by suffocating to death. That's what the cross, that's what the cross is. And yet many people have died on a cross. I don't know how many, maybe thousands. Tens of thousands of people have died on a Roman cross. And probably, I'm guessing, and I would probably be right, that at least a few brave souls were able to face crucifixion with courage. You know what I mean? Like Braveheart. A few people, I'm sure, have been able to face crucifixion with, with courage. But Jesus, he's, he's, he wasn't any ordinary person. He wasn't any ordinary man. Jesus is, as we say, the son of man. No, his soul was not sorrowful to the point of death because of the prospect of dying on the cross. But Jesus tells us why he was in so much anguish in his prayer. He says, my father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. This cup be taken from me. It is this cup that is causing Jesus so much suffering, so much anguish. And so what is this cup? Well, this cup, it refers to the cup of God's wrath for the sin of humanity. That's what this cup is referring to. The cup of God's wrath for the sins of humanity. Because Jesus knew that in just a few short hours, he would be suffering the full wrath of God. Not for any of his own sins, mind you. Jesus alone, among all the human beings that have walked on the face of this earth, he alone was sinless. And yet he alone would be the one who would suffer the full wrath of God for all the sins of all of humanity across all of time. And guess what? That includes all of your sins and all of my sins too, past, present, and future. Jesus suffered immensely to do the will of God. And there are some extremely important implications for us here today. And first of all, it's this. (laughs) That's not it. First of all, first implication, obeying God may lead to our suffering. Are you encouraged yet? (laughs) Obeying God may most definitely lead to our own suffering. The author of Hebrews made this incredible, incredible statement. I'm shocked every time I read it. Son though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered. Now, there's a whole lot of things that we can unpack from this very, very simple and short statement. But let me just point out right here and right now that when we are committed to doing the will of God, we will, sooner or later, suffer for it. We will. And, but here's the thing. When we suffer for doing the will of God, that, my brothers and sisters... My beloved brothers and sisters, that is when we have the opportunity for spiritual growth. That's how we grow spiritually. I heard this message uh, on my break. This one pastor, he shared about some research that was done at University of California in Berkeley. And these researchers, what they did was they put these amoebas. You know what amoebas are? These single-celled organisms they put these amoebas in a completely stress-free environment. (laughs) If you can imagine what a stress-free environment for an amoeba is. They put these amoebas in the ideal temperature. They put them in the ideal surroundings. And what do you suppose happened to these amoebas? They all died. 
all these amoebas died. And that makes perfect sense to me, actually, because I experienced this in my own life. And I'm thinking, I'm, and I'm guessing that you, you guys recognize this, this dynamic in your own life as well. So if you are the kind of person who is deathly allergic to suffering for the sake of doing God's will, guess what? You will never grow spiritually. You will never grow spiritually. And that's just facts. Facts, brothers and sisters. And the second thing, the second implication is this. And this is really, really hugely important. Even though doing the will of God may cause us to suffer and will probably cause us to suffer, the thing is this, is that none of us have to suffer in the way that Jesus suffered. None of us have to suffer in the way that he, he suffered. His suffering was unique. No one ever can or will or has to suffer the way that Jesus did on the cross to atone for the sins of all of humanity. No, nobody. We will, probably will suffer for doing the will of God, but none of us knows suffering like Jesus knows suffering. That's an amen, brothers and sisters. Jesus suffered the full, full wrath of God so that no one else would have to. He suffered the full wrath of God so that none of us would have to. And all we need to do to receive this incredible, amazing, undeserved act of grace is to put our trust in him and what he did for us and to follow him as our Lord and as our Savior. That is the gospel. That is the good news, brothers and sisters. The second thing that Jesus did for us is this. Jesus prayed to do God's will. Now, some people say that Jesus being tempted here uh, in, the, in the Garden of Gethsemane, that Jesus was being tempted by the devil. But the Bible actually never, never says that, despite the movie. I love the movie, The Passion of the Christ, but there was this one scene of Jesus in the garden and the devil shows up. That's, no, that's, found nowhere, that's found nowhere in the Bible. But it's clear that Jesus was being tempted somehow, some way. And again, verse 38, Jesus, Jesus prayed, My Father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken, taken from me. And at first it sounds like Jesus is asking God, the Father, is this even possible for this cup to be taken away from me? But in the Gospel of Mark, in the same scene, Jesus says explicitly, Abba, Father, everything is possible with you. Take this cup from me. And Mark is a little bit more demanding than, is it even possible? Jesus is saying, no, I know it's possible for you. Please take this cup from me. That's what Jesus is saying. He didn't want to suffer the full wrath of God. Who would? He didn't want to suffer the full wrath of God to atone for the sins of sinful humanity for you and me. But how, the question is, how would the Father have accomplished his purpose if he did not send Jesus to the cross, how would he do that? Well, like he's always done it in the past. By pouring out his wrath on the people and leaving a remnant to start over again. That's how God always did it in the Old Testament. But this is a new day and this is a new age. And God never wanted to do that. But now his son has come. And he had something more permanent and something much more glorious in mind. The redemption of the whole world through the sacrifice of his one and only son, Jesus Christ, once and for all. Anyway, the point is that Jesus here was not being tempted by the devil. What was he being tempted with? He was being tempted by his flesh. He was being tempted in his flesh his own human flesh because he was 100% human, more human probably than any of us, right? That's why the author of Hebrews, he wrote this, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way 
just as we are, yet he did not sin. Jesus knew. Jesus knew that the disciples were experiencing the same temptation that he was. The temptation for both him and for them was to bypass the Father's will and to pursue God's purposes on their own terms and not on God's terms. Do you get that? That was the temptation for both Jesus and for the disciples. And Jesus knew that his disciples would have to face that temptation for the rest of their lives, especially when their own lives, their own flesh was at stake. And that's why Jesus tells them. That's why Jesus tells these sleepy disciples in verse 41. He says, watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. Why? The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak because Jesus knows the flesh is weak. And that is exactly what Jesus was doing to overcome the temptation of his own flesh, too. That's what he was doing in the Garden of Gethsemane. And the key point of Jesus' prayer, when we, when we look at it, is when he prays, yet not as I will, but as you will, speaking to the Father. Jesus was determined to accept whatever the Father's will was, Which is why Jesus was praying in verse 42, My Father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. In other words, he was praying. If the Father's will was for him to drink the cup of God's wrath, even though his flesh was like screaming against that destiny, that the Father would give him the strength and the courage to face it. Brothers and sisters, Are you determined to accept the Father's will for your life, whatever it may be, even though none of us will ever have to suffer as much as Jesus Christ did, right? Are you praying that the Father would give you strength to face his will, whatever it may be, even though none of us will ever have to face the kind of suffering that Jesus Christ did? Are we praying these things? You know, the heart of the Lord's Prayer which we recite every week at the end of our service, and we're going to do it today too, is your kingdom come, which is God's purpose. Your will be done, which is God's will for your life. Do we mean that prayer when we pray it? When we're saying these words, do we mean it? Brothers and sisters, the Spirit is indeed willing But the flesh, as you know, is super weak. So we need to pray. We need to pray. And I hope that you will join us on Wednesday night so that we can pray. And when we pray, especially when we pray the Lord's Prayer, we ought to mean it, shouldn't we? We ought to mean it. The last thing that Jesus does is this. Jesus forgave us to do God's will. You know, when we know what the Father's purpose is in this world and for our lives, and when we pray that God would do his will in our lives, when we pray that we would be able to do God's will in our lives, you know what's going to happen? God's will for our lives will be very clear. It will be crystal clear. We'll we'll be able to see it like right in front of us. We cannot avoid it when we know God's purpose and we pray for God's will, right? And the Father's will for our lives, it's evident through the circumstances that he arranges for us, whatever they may be. Oswald Chambers, he often says that God is the engineer of our circumstances. God is the engineer of our circumstances and he is engineering his will in our lives, constantly drawing calling us into his will. And just as an example here, Jesus was praying to the Father, please do not make me drink this cup of your wrath. I don't want to do it. But if I have to, give me the strength to do it. And he was praying this throughout the whole night, maybe three hours, who knows how long he was praying this. And so when did Jesus realize, when did he realize what the Father's answer was? Did he realize it while he was praying it? No, 
Jesus knew the answer to his prayer when he heard the footsteps of the soldiers coming to get him. That's when Jesus knew the answer to God's prayer when they came to arrest him. And at that moment, at that moment, did he get angry or bitter? He's like, God, I pray to take this cup away from me. No, he didn't get angry or bitter. Was he confused about God's will? I don't get this. I just prayed to God. I just prayed to God to take this cup away from me. What's the, what are these footsteps that I'm hearing? No, he was not confused about it at all. And when he heard these footsteps, did he ignore God's will? Like, oh, I don't hear anything. Nothing going on here. <laughs> right? Did he tell his disciples to take up arms and to fight so that he could escape in the melee? No. Did he call down the hosts of heaven to destroy the Romans and to destroy the unbelieving Jews so that he could start again with his disciples, a new kingdom? No. What did Jesus do? Jesus surrendered. He didn't surrender to the soldiers. He surrendered to God's will. Jesus surrendered to the Father's will. You see, when Jesus told his sleepy disciples, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak, he was not giving them an excuse to be weak in the flesh. That's how I always read this passage, don't you? Whenever I read that, I'm like, whew, I can be weak in the flesh, and Jesus is okay with that. But that's not what Jesus was doing, was he? He was not giving them an excuse. He's not giving us an excuse to sin. He's not giving us an out from doing God's will for the sake of our own personal comfort and for the sake of our own personal convenience. When I read this, Jesus is speaking to me, and he's giving me an exhortation to pray, to pray in order to resist temptation. He's telling me to pray so that I might follow God's will for my life. Follow God's will. But I want an excuse. I want an out. So whenever I read this passage, I'm, I'm so like super sympathetic with, with the disciples, right? I'm so sympathetic with these guys because I am 1,000% sure that if I were there, if I were there in that place with them, what would I be doing? I would be snoozing. I would be snoring. While my Lord Jesus Christ is there suffering, praying. Three times he went to pray. Three times I fall asleep. And the third time when Jesus had to wake him up because, you know, he was about to be arrested. They were going to ridicule him, torture him, and going to hang him up on a cross. The third time he woke them, you would think that Jesus would be pretty annoyed and angry. <laughs> right? Again. Don't you hear the footsteps? But what Jesus does next may be one of the most astonishing, surprising, amazing, gut-wrenching acts that we find in the Gospels. Because it is so, so different from human nature. It is so, so opposite of my own nature. Jesus tells them, rise. Rise. Let us go. Let us go. What's he doing? You see, what, even when we fail... Whenever we fail, and we fail all the time, whenever we fail over and over and over again, Jesus gives us another chance. He gives us another chance to rise up and to follow him to the cross to be his witness again and again and again. Whenever we fail and then we fail again, Jesus says, rise, let us go. And he gives us another chance to do the will of God, to do God's will. How can this be? How can this be for sinners like, for, like sinners like me? Well, it's because through faith in him, I do not drink from the cup of God's wrath. I drink from the cup 
of God's grace. The blood of Jesus Christ. And the blood of Jesus has never failed me yet. And it never will. Nor will the blood of Jesus ever fail you. Trust me on this point, brothers and sisters. Jesus said, This is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Forgiveness of sins. Oswald Chambers, one of my spiritual heroes, he said this, In the Garden of Gethsemane, the disciples went to sleep when they should have stayed awake. And once they realized what they had done, it produced despair. The sense of having done something irreversible, irreversible tends to make us despair. I've been there. We say, well, it's all over, and it's ruined. It's ruined now. What's the point in trying anymore? If we think this kind of despair is an exception, we are mistaken. It is a very ordinary human experience. But Jesus comes and lovingly says to us, in essence, go ahead and sleep. That opportunity is lost forever, and you can't change that. But now, get up, and let's go on to the next thing. In other words, let the past sleep, but let it sleep in the sweet embrace of Christ, and let us go on into the invincible future with him. Brothers and sisters, let us go on into the invincible future with our Lord Jesus Christ. We know what God's purpose is. What's God's purpose? It's to fill this earth with his glory in Jesus' name through God-fearing, God-honoring, God-worshipping, God-loving communities and families, which is the church. We know God's purpose. And in light of God's purpose, can you hear the voice of Jesus Christ? And he's saying, Rise, let us go. He's calling us to follow him, to do his will, to do the will of God. Rise, let us go. That call is the only reason that this church exists. Rise, <laughs> thank God for the extra hour. Rise, let us go. That's the only reason that any of us are sitting here right now. Rise! Let us go! That's why any of us here are saved, if you are indeed saved. Rise! Let us go! That's why we started House Church Ministry. And if you're not part of a House Church Ministry, join a House Church Ministry. Join a House Church. And if you don't know where to begin, ask Pastor Nathan, ask myself. We'll get you plugged in. We have a bunch of wonderful shepherds here who are more than willing to take you. Amen? Amen? Rise, let us go! We need shepherds. Will you be a shepherd? We need you. We need you. Because we know what God's will is. God's will is to see people saved. And that's what house church ministry is all about, to see people saved. Rise, let us go. That's, where, that's why we're starting the second service. Rise, let us go. Will you step up and step into a ministry to help grow this community, to, to bring glory to our Lord Jesus Christ? You know, because Jesus, he has called us here, this canvas ministry, to declare his praises, right? To renew the hope of Jesus Christ and his church here in the South Bay and in California and to the ends of, ends of the earth. That's why we're here. That's why we're here. Rise, brothers and sisters. Let us go. Because we can't assume that there's anybody else out there who's hearing Jesus' voice. We can't assume that there's anybody out there who's even awake. Are we awake? Brothers and sisters, rise. Let us go. Let's come to the Lord in prayer.